for attending this session. Uh, my name is Chuck Sabin, and I turned that off because I've got a loud mic. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for attending this session. Again, my name is Chuck Sabin. I'm the Senior Director for Market Development for the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. I put on a live, in, live mic or a, a loud mic because I like to walk around and, and use my hands and so on. Uh, but uh, many of you, through a variety of resources and presentations, probably have seen information about Oracast and what Oracast is. Uh, but there, we have made more progress on the direction of the of the technology uh, and uh, momentum around products that are being coming available with uh, Oracast in them. And I've got some other individuals that are implementing it from other companies that are going to be coming up and helping with this presentation. But we wanted to give you a sense of some of the progress and the momentum and the direction that we are seeing for the market uh, associated with, uh, with Oracast. So thank you again for your, for your attendance at this time. Um, so from a learning objectives perspective, I did want to do a little bit of a reintroduction uh, of, of Oracast broadcast audio just so there's a nice level set on the technology and what it's doing and what its intent is. I uh, wanted to talk to you about recent announcements and progress and availability of Oracast enabled devices that are in the market. We've made a lot of momentum in that area from last year. I uh, wanted to talk, have some discussion around uh, latest updates and progress towards availability in public locations. And then also give you a better understanding of the Oracast system in general and the devices that are available for you here at the HLAA conference to try this out right now. So we do have devices that we are loaning out to people in the conference rooms. These, these workshop conference rooms are enabled with an ORI system from Amtronic and Listen Technologies. And you can actually try the system out uh, live here at the HLA this, uh, this week. So I will be joined by other individuals to help with these, uh, to help achieve these learning objectives. Uh, we'll have Sam Birkenshaw from, uh, from Amtronic will come up and talk a bit. We'll have Tracy, Tracy Bathurst uh, from Listen Technologies. And then Rich Fisher uh, from uh, GN Hearing also coming up and giving their accounting for what they're doing and the direction that they're taking Oracast for their businesses for the benefit of those with hearing loss. I do want to quickly just start with, a, with just a little bit about who I am and the organization that I work for. So I am part of the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. We are the organization that manages the technology on behalf of all of the companies that actually use it in their products. So we don't make the products, we manage the technology that goes into those products and then those products are then designed for the, for the use case that they're, that they're building for. So we manage the standards development, the, the introduction of new features and capabilities that go into that specification. We also manage the product certification and qualification of those products to ensure that they're following the specification in the way that they should and that they all interoperate together uh, using the specification in a proper manner. We also manage also the, the, the trademark and all the licensing associated with the technology that goes into those, into those devices. And as an industry trade association, we also do all of the marketing and the brand and the promotion associated with use cases and markets and, and availability of the technology for various use cases as we're going to talk about it with uh, Oracast and the broadcast audio functionality. Now, for the last 20 years, uh, Bluetooth has been a leader in wireless audio capabilities. But it was many years ago, or several years ago, that companies started looking at what's, what do we need in the market, what do we need as far as capabilities are concerned to address the next 20 years of audio innovation and wireless audio innovation in the, in the market. And it was actually a very specific group of companies that actually came to the table <coughs> that really started this process. And it was actually the hearing aid companies. The hearing aid companies came to the Bluetooth Special Interest Group as a group stating that they needed to have better audio capabilities, better wireless audio capabilities for the hearing aids, better standardization for hearing aids. 
and they wanted to standardize on Bluetooth technology and make it better for everyone across all hearing devices uh, to get access to, to wireless audio. So it was, the, it was the hearing aid companies that originally came to the Bluetooth Special Interest Group in the first place. And what they ended up spearheading is the delivery and the development of LE Audio. Now LE Audio is the new and next generation architecture for audio, for Bluetooth, for the next 20 years. Now, there are two architectures for, for Bluetooth. There's classic Bluetooth audio, which you've all known and have been using in the past, and there is now the LE audio architecture. Now, this is not to say that the, that the classic architecture is going away. This is not to say that because the LE audio architecture has been introduced, the capabilities that you have currently in your hearing aids or in your cochlear implants or any other audio devices is going to suddenly stop working. This is a new architecture that will layer on top of or work in conjunction with the original architecture. And most devices will actually run both architectures at the exact same time while new innovation and new capabilities come into and onto the new architecture for the future. Now when we think about the new LE Audio architecture, there are really three core things that are coming to this, coming with this new architecture. Uh, the first is around the quality of the devices, the quality of the specification, and, uh, and providing incremental benefit and quality, performance, and power associated with, the, with Bluetooth devices. So ultimately raising the bar in quality, power, and performance of all Bluetooth devices overall. But the net new capabilities are within the hearing ecosystem. So the first part is around new standardization for hearing aids. So as I mentioned before, the hearing aid companies are the ones that came to the Bluetooth Special Interest Group and stated we need to standardize better on Bluetooth technology for, uh, for hearing aids. So that meant bringing in new standardization for hearing aids that is now universal across all hearing aids that is now being implemented by GN, Starkey, and everyone else that's on the, uh, on the, the, the hearing aid hit list uh, is actually implementing the new capabilities for global interoperability of your hearing devices for the future of connecting to phones, tablets, PCs, TVs, and so on and so forth. The third area is around Oracast broadcast audio. And Oracast is what we're going to spend most of our time today talking about in terms of what that brings to the hearing ecosystem and how that how the progress that we're making in delivering and building that out for the for the future. And we really do see this as not just the broadcast audio capability for everybody, but the next generation of assistive listening system capabilities as well for the hearing community. So let's start just a little bit with, you know, what is AuraCast and, and, and how does it work? AuraCast provides the ability for a transmitter or an audio source to be able to broadcast a Bluetooth audio signal to an unlimited number of users of, of devices that are within, within range. So if everyone in this room had an AuraCast enabled device and we're, we're listening to the broadcast from the RE transmitter, Everyone in this room would have the ability to hear that audio at the exact same time in the exact same way. And that's a lot different than how I used to have my own, how I have my own personal relationship between my phone and maybe my hearing device. This is about broadcast capabilities in public spaces. And there's three components that are associated with the AuraCast system. There's the transmitter, there's the receiver, and then there's what we call the assistant device in this. Now a transmitter can be any audio source, it can be a smartphone, tablet, PC, public address system, AV system, anything that is broadcasting audio for any purpose, uh, for any reason, can be a transmitter of, of audio uh, to the hearing devices that, uh, that support Oracast. On the receiver end, this is where we're talking about your, your hearing aids, your cochlear implants, but also, as we see the capability for Bluetooth, this is addressing to people with, uh, with uh, TWS earbuds, 
or headsets or headphones or mobile speakers can all be recipients of the broadcast from a, from a transmitter. Now we also have this concept of an assistant. An assistant really is, it's the remote control for you to be able to, to connect to or listen to a particular broadcast. And a remote, and, and the, the assistant can come in a number of different forms. It can be your smartphone, it can be a, a, a small specific device, it can be integrated into a potential receiver, but ultimately its design is because we envision this capability to have to where you will have multiple broadcasts in a single location. And oftentimes you're going to need or look for some type of an assistant to be able to help you address which one do I want to listen to? Do I want to listen to this language? Do I want to listen to certain types of dialogue enhancement? What is the audio that I actually want to listen to? And the assistant is going to help you determine which broadcast you actually want to listen to. And, and uh, um, Sam and, and um, Tracy will talk about how their devices have a bit of an assistant on the receiver specifically and how that works for, uh, for users in that case as well. So those are the three main components associated with the, the Oracast broadcast. Again, it is strictly a broadcast of audio from a transmitter directly to a number of devices. The one way to think about this is that in the same way that you're able to scan for and look for Wi-Fi access points for, uh, for internet access, in the future you'll be able to scan for Bluetooth or Oracast access points for audio access in a variety of public spaces. There are three main use cases or main ways that we are categorizing the initial capabilities for Oracast and where Oracast is, is sort of focused at this point in time. The first is around sharing your audio. This is around me being able to share my audio with you. These are personal sharing perspectives where I might have a video experience on my laptop and I want to share it with my friends and family around me. So you, as being hearing recipients with, uh, with hearing aids or, or cochlear implants, will actually be able to enjoy that experience just like everybody else by being able to listen to the broadcast from, a, from an audio from a, from a smartphone or audio from a, from a laptop and enjoy that same video experience along with everybody else that's around that, around that space. So again, share your audio is me wanting to share my audio with you. And regardless of what type of receiver you have, you'll be able to enjoy the experience just like everybody else. Uh, <clears throat> does that mean that your phone is going to broadcast? So the question, so we can do questions afterwards, but I'll answer that question and the answer is yes. The question was, if no one heard, the question was, does that mean your phone was going to be able to broadcast? And the answer is yes, it will be able to broadcast. Like as an example, Samsung with their S23, S24 Fold platform uh, has the ability to transmit an Oracast broadcast signal and any device that has the capability of receiving an Oracast based transmission can listen to the audio from this particular device. We're actually demonstrating that in the, in the booth uh, that we have in the exhibition area where we have an, a Samsung platform uh, just broadcasting music, and then if you have an Orcast enabled device, you're able to listen to that music from that uh, from that phone. So again, that's a personal sharing scenario that is is part of the delivery of Orcast broadcast audio. So you being able to participate in that using your hearing devices is exactly the the scenario that you would be able to enjoy at that point. The second area is around unmuting your world, and, and really this is, silent TVs are around us. I know for people with hearing loss and deaf, that's probably even more indicative, even when the volume is on the television. Uh, but we know that if you go to uh, waiting rooms or train stations or bars or other places where you might have uh, a, a, a video experience, oftentimes you don't have an audio experience. And what Oracast is enabling for that is that you have the ability to broadcast the audio wirelessly, silently, but then receive that audio on your Oracast-enabled device. So if you have earbuds or a hearing aid or cochlear implants, you'll be able to see what audio is available to you, and you'll be able to listen to that directly, and you can listen to your audio experience independently of whatever audio experience someone else might be listening to. So if there are 
multiple TVs on the wall. You can choose which one you actually want to listen to and unmute your world and start having a, an audio experience now associated with that video experience as well. Now the third area, and this is really where advocacy for hearing loss and, and hearing your best really comes into play, and this is how do you provide audio access in public spaces uh, where you're talking about train stations, uh, airports, places of worship, uh, waiting rooms, anywhere you need an, an audio experience or want a better audio experience because it's either difficult to hear or you just need the, the, the extra support of audio in those, in those locations. And so this is where improving your audio accessibility, providing the next generation of assistive listening, the example in this case is around an airport, so think about the fact that there are multiple gates at an airport and you want to be able to listen to just the audio associated with your particular gate. That's where the AuraCast experience can actually tune into, is it gate 23, 24, 25, whichever one I want to listen to, you now have the ability to, to see that broadcast and listen to that directly into your, uh, into your earbuds. And I say now when you have that avail availability, you know, these are the things that, and these are the, the scenarios, and these are the uh, use cases that companies like Amtronic and Listen Technologies are targeting in order to provide better hearing experiences for, uh, for everyone. And this applies not just to people with hearing loss, it applies to everyone that has difficulty or struggles with hearing audio in various, uh, in various venues. And it does go, it does apply to a number of different venue opportunities, anywhere from airports to bars to theaters. These are all areas that can benefit from augmented audio and augmented audio experiences or assistive audio experiences. And we envision all of these, uh, these locations as being potential recipients of an Oracast broadcast audio solution and providing new capabilities and new ways for you to access audio in public spaces. Now, we have been, for the last year, year and a half at this point, uh, have been going around the world, me as a, as a, from an organization perspective, going around the world, uh, um, explaining and demonstrating to people how this capability will actually work. And so we've been putting on a series of uh, AuraCast experience events. Uh, last year we put on about 13 or more of these events uh, where we were providing more of an immersive experience for people to come to a venue and see and hear multiple different types of experiences uh, uh, in the way that AuraCast would actually enable that. And we continue to look towards this as a, as a platform for the future in terms of continuing to communicate and, and address and promote the capabilities associated with, uh, with ORACAS. We've already done six so far this year with CS, CES, ISC, uh, we did, we were been at HearTech and other uh, locations in terms of doing more of these immersive, uh, these more immersive experiences, including here at HLAA, where one, we have the conference rooms that are enabled, and then also in the exhibition hall, we actually have an experience set up that you can, that you can experience for yourselves as well. So we will continue to move these experiences through and continue to promote the benefits and the possibilities associated with this capability and continue to get more and more support behind these capabilities delivered into the, into the market. And it's been productive in doing so. I think last year at this time, I would have only been able to put two logos on the, on the screen in terms of who was supporting or committing their support towards delivering uh, uh, LA Audio and AuraCast. And that would have actually been Amtronic, who had announced their, the, the, that they were moving forward on an RE system. Uh, not, they didn't know the name at the time, but they were saying we were going to commit to that. Uh, and then I think also uh, Cochlear had mentioned that they were still, uh, that they were making their cochlear implant capable of the, of, uh, of uh, or enabling it, but not capable, but not enabling it just yet. Now we have multiple companies that have, uh, have announced and delivered their support from ReSound, JBL, Samsung is all in. 
Uh, they've delivered it into the, as a transmitter through their phones. Their phones are also an assistant. They've delivered it through their earbuds that have the capability. Uh, and many of their uh, 4K televisions also have uh, the capability as well. And there are more coming. Android has announced that they are uh, starting to support the capabilities in Android 15. That should be available later this year. And that will kickstart more phone platforms and more availability of, of devices that have the uh, that have Oracast and LEIDO capabilities in them. So we are seeing a lot of momentum behind this. We know of more launches that aren't on here that I can't talk about, but you'll start seeing those come through either at uh, um, uh, IFA, which is a consumer electronics show in Berlin, <coughs> or at OIHA, which is a uh, hearing aid manufacturer show that will be in Hanover. Uh, come later this year. So you will start seeing more and more devices coming with this capability uh, for the future as well. And we've also seen as another sign of continued momentum, uh, Google Maps uh, actually just, and I know this has been capable for showing uh, availability of loop systems and assistive listening capabilities. Uh, Google Maps through an, a, an accessibility announcement they just put out in May now is giving businesses the opportunity to indicate availability of Oracast in, at their location. It actually is identified as, a, as an item, so if I'm a business, I can identify whether or not I have Oracast available in my business. And this is important because we have solutions that are starting to be delivered to those businesses in order to provide assistive listening capabilities in their business, and we want to make sure that there's an indication for that for the users so users can understand whether or not the capability is there or not. So we're excited about the fact that we're continuing to see momentum on this end as well to inform users of what's available uh, for the future. Now I'm going to get out of the way and let, uh, and let Sam and Tracy and Rich talk about where they're taking their direction, uh, but we really do see Oracast as the next generation of assistive listening capabilities for users such as yourselves. Uh, we believe that the deployment capabilities of what you can do with this system makes it very simple to deliver a new system into a, uh, into a venue. It works in conjunction with or on top of a telecoil system, so this is not about pulling telecoils out of the out of businesses is about giving more options and more capabilities for assistive listening for people with hearing loss. So it's in the same way that we have an overlay system of Ori here today over on top of the telecoil that's here, that will be the case for businesses in the future as well. So again, it's about providing more accessibility, more capabilities, and more access opportunities for users. So I'm going to hand it over to Tracy or Sam, which one are you going first? Both. Both, Both are coming up, so I'm going to give it to Tracy and Sam and let them uh, talk about Ori and how Amtronic and Listen are looking at the Oracast systems for the future. Thanks, Chuck. Can you hear me? Hello? Cowboy. Cowboy. All right, excellent. <laughs> Okay, as uh, Chuck said, my name is Tracy Bathurst. I'm the uh, CTO of Listen Technologies, and today um, we would like to let's go back uh, provide a little more detail as to the assistive listening system that we are uh, going to provide to the market, where we have launches later this year, where installs are going to start then. So this system uses the RCast technology and is really the uh, culmination of the efforts of Amtronic and Listen brought together as a partnership delivering um, this technology to the market. And uh, it, it started with a common mission of delivering this solution, this high quality audio uh, to allow us to hear better, allow everyone to hear better. And uh, so, Sam? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Tracy. So, can everybody hear me? Channel one? <laughs> Great, thank you. Forget the accent. Um, you can't hear me? Turn it up. Turn it up. <clears throat> Let's have a look. Six. 
Is that better now? Yeah? Okay, hopefully the speakers are okay with that. <laughs> okay, so I'm from Amatronic. We're um, a company based in the UK, and it came up earlier in the, um, the luncheon group that um, Amatronic and Listen are both part of uh, one organization called Orvida. And another member of the Orvida group is, is Contacta, um, who some of you may be familiar with as a, a loop manufacturer. Amatronic's also a loop manufacturer, and Listen Technologies have been developing receiver based assistive listening products for in excess of 20 years. All three of us being part of, of one group allows us to, to pull on the strengths of, of um, each other in certain applications. So Amatronic have been working on um, Ori for going on eight years, and uh, we've done a fantastic job on the transmitter, but Listen Technologies has such a pedigree with their receivers that we decided to draw upon their experience and their, um, their expertise with the receiver-based technology so that uh, we can have a best-in-class uh, solution. Another example of the collaboration in the group is for this event, the loop provided are by both Amtronic and Contactor, um, drawing on both companies' um, unique um, skills in different places. So um, across the entire group, really, we've got a mission to help people communicate and uh, get the right audio in the right location. So the first collaboration from um, Amtronic and Listen was our Ori system. And so um, Ori is a Bluetooth um, broadcast system using the AuraCast um, features of Bluetooth learning and audio. And um, it's an entire ecosystem. So uh, we're going to go through the, um, the transmitter, the receiver, um, the docks, and why each of those elements is, is important. But it's highly flexible to suit the environment that it's going into. So it could be that we want to have an open broadcast that anybody can connect to, like we have here. Or it could be that we want to encrypt the signal so that somebody that we don't want to listen into the room isn't able to. Um, we can also have it so we can cover huge areas. This transmitter you can pick up right out in the corridor. Um, or we can scale down the system so that we cover just a small meeting room. So it's really flexible to suit different environments and also some different applications. So it could be that it's being used for assistive listening in the environment we have here. It could be that it's being used to get audio from digital signage out in public spaces and could go into a variety of different environments that we'll touch on again uh, as we go through. So um, Tracy's going to um, take us through um, how the system works. Yeah, so uh, as Sam mentioned, there are, uh, there's basically four pieces to the system. You have a transmitter, you have the receiver, you have a charging dock that's used for con uh, charging and configuration of the receivers, and then you have some software that is used to manage and control uh, the entire system. So, um, from a overall system, it's designed to be simple and flexible. You get an audio source. The inputs are designed to be really friendly to a number of, in, of uh, different environments, different public spaces, what they've got. So a situation like this where you may feed from a console, it's easily connected to the transmitter, it can uh, take in microphones directly, and it can take in uh, networked audio. So if you have a large venue that, that transports audio across networks, the system can support all that. All that translates to is flexibility to go into a large number of public spaces, which is what we're targeting with the system. So, once you have the transmitter, uh, the audio source to the transmitter, it takes that and uh, creates an R-cast broadcast, which is exactly what Chuck was talking about. It meets the standards, broadcast to any number of receivers from any different manufacturer that's, that's R-cast compatible. That receiver uh, then can uh, take that signal and produce audio from that, as long as it's RCast compatible. So we're going to dive into a little bit more of the, of the transmitter and how that, that works. So we, we mentioned the range. That's a common question that we get asked. How far will uh, the transmitter go? And, and we mentioned here that we can go in multiple rooms. 
we're, we designed the transmitter to be um, about equivalent to uh, what a typical RF assistive listening would be. There's going to be some, some uh, situations depending on the environment that may change that. But in general, um, you're talking about the same overall range. We, we're, we use, it's designed to be the maximum power that is allowed in that band. Uh, so typical assistive listening ranges we should see with this product. Uh, also, there is two channels of audio. So that enables us to uh, have a, a variety of feeds. You can say the same content uh, in, both, in both channels, but one may be a different quality than the other, or one may be in a different language. So being able to, on a single transmitter, transmit one in uh, English and another in Spanish creates opportunities for these things to go into more and more venues uh, and uh, have wider applications. So it looks like a Wi-Fi access point, we, and that's intended to do that. We want to make it easy for the venue to install this thing, something familiar with them, so that we get more of these things out there, that it's not a difficult situation for uh, a venue to make a decision to put this in, and then they can manage it the same way they, they manage other devices. So, friendly for the venue, encourages more installations. Sure, so um, with the system it's been designed so it can coexist with other technologies. And we've got an example shown here of a loop amplifier and a ORI transmitter. And it's not dissimilar to what we have in this room actually. So in this room we've got the audio going from this microphone, and all the microphones we're wearing, into the mixing console in the corner of the room. And then we have a feed coming out for the assistive listening. It's just one output from the desk. And that signal goes into the loop amplifier, and then out of the loop amplifier into the ORI system. We could do it the other way around as well. So we go into ORI and then out into the loop but they're coexisting with the same input to the system. So you should be getting the same experience regardless as to whether you're listening through the loop or through the ORI system in here. Um, and it's not that uncommon to see um, what we call hybrid systems in, in the real world at the moment as well. So, um, loop is a fantastic technology, it's where our it comes from, but it does have some limitations. And um, we find in theatres, for instance, they might put a loop system in, and also have an infrared system so that they can hand out receivers easily and also use multiple channels so they can do audio description for the blind, say, or um, have multiple languages available in the same space. And so um, we're expecting there to be plenty of applications where you have loop and ORI, or maybe have ORI and infrared, a hybrid selection of different technologies in the same space. So on the receiver side, the second component of the, of the system, uh, as Chuck mentioned, there's the system. In this situation, we've incorporated the system as part of the receiver. It's all one, uh, one device. And the idea is to make this a simple to use uh, uh, device provided at, uh, at the venue. And the charging dock allows you to configure it in many different ways. So we have an example here where you're selecting uh, the, the demonstration here that we're offering at the HLA. You can select between multiple channels. But the system can be designed so that it automatically connects to channels to simplify the, the, the process. Maybe if there's one or two transmitters, there is, uh, uh, it only connects to those two broadcasts or three broadcasts that are that are available and they um, it may auto connect to them when they're in range so that from a user's perspective you pick up the device and it connects to the uh, the transmitter in that venue and you go out of the room and you go to another area and it would connect to the other device so that sort of functionality will be built into the receiver um, as we move forward and receivers are important to provide, you know, it, it, we're at the beginning of 
this adoption of the technology. And there's not a, uh, a lot of uh, receivers out there, but there's more and more every day. And we start to see that, that um, uh, accelerate as we move forward. But still, there's going to be uh, venues that uh, need to provide receivers to people uh, that don't have compatible or cast compatible devices. So it's important to have those and it's still required by the ADA as well. So the additional, the receiver was designed to meet ADA requirements from being able to put a, uh, a neck loop in it and drive a neck loop. It's integrated with, there's a neck loop lanyard supported with the device. Um, the volume levels, the, you know, all the aspects of the, um, the receiver is designed to be flexible to support a wide variety of hearing applications. And I didn't mention this on the transmitter, but uh, in the transmitter, we, it was targeted for assistive listening devices, so we have automatic level control that uh, equalizes levels so that talkers appear at the same length, even if I'm talking. And I naturally tend to talk. Um, so that's incorporated in some uh, filtering to, to optimize for intelligibility is all part of the RE system. And there's a number of accessories that are associated with the receiver that can be pro provided by the venue. They, it supports, uh, as we mentioned, neck loops, uh, a variety of uh, headsets, um, and even devices that you bring your own, as long as they're compatible with a, a three and a half millimeter jack. And as time goes on, compatibility will increase with um, a large number of AuraCast receivers that reach the market, Ear, including earbuds. As Chuck was talking about, you're going to be able to use um, uh, earbuds and other hearing devices coming into the venues with the RE system. All compatible, all being able to improve hearing to uh, the participants in the, in the venue. Some of the applications that we see for, for AuraCast and, and Ori um, include education. So um, for a long time, education has been one of the, the primary markets for us in assistive listening. And we don't see that changing at all. Um, in actual fact, um, when introducing Glory, we've been talking to some of the universities globally who might not have even implemented assistive listening at this point, who are now all of a sudden looking, okay, we can cover all of our spaces very quickly um, and, and implement this new technology um, at a speed that they couldn't with other uh, solutions. So education is one that we definitely see as a, a good application for, for AuraCast. Um, corporate, so corporate boardrooms, um, as well as meeting room spaces, um, and government facilities um, we see as, as good applications for, for AuraCast. Um, the other week, one of my colleagues had a, a meeting with a, a UK uh, government agency, and um, they were looking at equipping 600 spaces with assistive listening. Um, again, they didn't have a provision at all um, prior to um, deciding to, to implement a, a solution. They were looking at Loop to begin with, and they are still looking at Loop alongside Ori, so that they've got the ability to interface with both current hearing aid users and people that get the new devices as they become available to the market. Houses of Worship, um, again, a, a traditional application for us with assistive listening, and um, we've seen a, a great amount of interest from um, Houses of Worship, which tend to be quite challenging acoustic environments for everybody. So um, both those that have taken the step to get hearing aids and people that might not have taken that step but want to benefit from a direct feed can um, make use of an AuraCast system in that environment. And then finally entertainment. Um, so earlier uh, Thomas Carlton was talking about his experience with music festivals. Um, Thankfully, um, quite a few music festivals are now implementing assistive listening, but it tends to be restricted to a small area of the, of the festival. So uh, typically it's the access platform at the, at the back of the, uh, of the field next to where the mixing console is. Well, using Glory, we can quickly cover an entire festival site 
um, with just a couple of transmitters. So somebody can walk around the entire site and get access to a direct feed from the console. So it's bringing um, more people access to, um, to good quality audio in those types of environments. When it comes to compliance, um, we have um, a few different um, components of our system. So we've got the transmitter and also the receivers. So from an ADA point of view, even when this is direct to hearing aid and everybody's carrying their own hearing aids, there'll still be a requirement for receivers that can be provided to end users following the current ADA guidance. Again, we've got the net groups available and um, signage is, is always key with any assistive listening system. Um, something that I put out here though is that we're also compliant with the Bluetooth standard. And, um, and Chuck made a comment in a previous session about the Bluetooth uh, technology always being updated. There's, there's always um, additional patches coming in and we want to ensure we've got compatibility going forward. So all of the devices that we have are network connected. Um, meaning that the receivers can sit in a, a charging dock and receive updates with the latest Bluetooth stack as we have the transmitter so that we're compliant with everybody's devices going forward and it's not just a snapshot of the devices that are available on the market today at time of launch. So um, there's, Oracast is an additional technology that's available um, for assistive listening um, but Every technology, we believe, still has its place. Um, and so, um, hearing loop in particular is very good for transient environments. And we really need to see a large number of users with their own devices to see the same kind of benefit as hearing loop in those transient environments. It's a matter of when, not if. So, when the end users come uh, and have the, the receiving devices, we see Oracast as a good application. Um, but account loop, for instance, we're not saying that Oracast replaces counter loops today um, because it's uh, somewhat a complex issue to, to try and solve there. Um, RF could still be useful in um, large spaces where we're looking to cover an entire um, bowl of a stadium. We might want to look at an RF solution there um, so that we get the, the coverage. Although, again, we'll get there with Oracast as we get more experience in the systems in the field. Um, IR is a very secure technology. You need to have a line of sight to be able to receive it. So if we're looking at um, doing courtrooms, for instance, we want to know that when we shut the door, nobody outside can hear into the courtroom. Ori, being a uh, broadcast, could be picked up outside, although we can issue encryption keys to secure it down. Um, but there's pros and cons to, to all of the different technologies out there. Audio over Wi-Fi is another one that, if you're looking at high channel counts, could be that that makes sense as a technology for you. Um, there's no one-fits-all solution today. Right. right. Yeah. And as the systems evolve and our cast evolves, we're going to see more and more overlap as these, as uh, we move forward, and and new innovations that help take care of those those cases that we talked about, such as loops and. Uh, and uh, adoption in those areas. And that's one of the great things about Oracast and the, uh, the path moving forward is it's really a great foundation that as manufacturers you can build solutions that um, can solve problems that everyone here and in the rest of the country in improving hearing overall. <coughs> overview of what we're working on right now in the, in the ecosystem and um, we're looking forward to getting this into the market is that later this year we expect to have some uh, some introductory installations and then uh, moving next year uh, the system in full full production full installations everywhere and uh, uh, and then uh, advances and improvements from there. Sure. Just one thing I'd like to add is that um, as we're introducing the product to market, we're looking to gain end user feedback. And so we've got some feedback forms that we're giving out here that um, we'd really appreciate your feedback. If you submit feedback, we'll send you a, 
a, um, a Starbucks voucher as a, as a thank you for, uh, for giving us the feedback. Um, but we're also looking for, for pilot sites. So if somebody has a, a venue in their area that they think would be suitable for us to do some tests, invite the community in and gain their feedback, please do get in touch with us. Um, Tracy and myself are going to be around, uh, as well as Kim on the, on the Bluetooth stand. So um, please don't be a stranger and uh, come over and say hello. So, we just hand over to, to Rich now, Steve through GM. Hello everyone. Can I do the cowboy check? Cowboy? Yep. Okay, good deal. So hello, I'm Rich Fisher with GN, a Danish company based out of Copenhagen, actually a, a suburb of Copenhagen. Uh, you may know us better as some of our hearing aid brands of Resound and Beltone and Jabra. Uh, and, uh, but we are a 150 year old company that has a history of, as it says succinctly here, bringing people closer. We didn't always have that slogan, but from the days we were laying cable from Europe to China, we've been using audio and bringing people closer to, 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 through communication and connectivity. And I think that really kind of sets the stage of why something like AuraCast and Bluetooth low energy, low energy audio is so important to us. And I joined this industry a little over five years ago, a pretty exciting time to join the industry, especially when it comes to things like we're here today talking about. Um, and I want to, when I talk about the GN perspective of this and why it matters to us and why hopefully it matters to you, I want to rewind just a little bit and tell the story of why, it's, why things they are a little bit different and again why it should matter to you. So a little bit about GN. So you may know us through our hearing aids, again the brands I said, Resound, Beltone, Jabra, but we actually have three divisions. And I'm going to talk about this because it's important later on to the story here, but we have an enterprise division which Many of you maybe have seen our Jabra brands through audio and visual uh, video conferencing in your offices. Uh, we also have a gaming and audio division, so that's earbuds, and we also have these super cool headsets that go with some, some of our gaming for gamers for uh, gaming headsets. Uh, and then we have the hearing division. I bring this up because there's a breadth of products, many connected through audio, um, and more importantly, a breadth of research and development. And through that, this common connection and purpose of bringing people closer. And I'm going to drill down a little bit further into our hearing division. And again, important because we have a philosophy that's called organic hearing. As the name would imply, we develop our hearing aids to emulate the way we hear naturally. This also then translates to how we design our hearing aids to fit comfortably, size, uh, and more recently, well at least within the last 10 to 15 years, to connect easily. So looking at, uh, we know that we connect with devices and people every day. So when we think about organic hearing, um, all of these things that go into this commitment to making it a natural experience for people who are wearing our hearing aids. So I mentioned all this to get to, excuse me, I, get, I mentioned all this to get to a point of how organic hearing has led us to some innovations. I'm not going to go through all of these. I'm going to focus in on a couple of them. And the first one is 2010, when we talk about 2.4 gigahertz and wireless connectivity. So if we remember back in the early 2000s when uh, Bluetooth kind of burst onto the scene and we had wireless uh, connectivity amongst a whole bunch of ele electronic um, devices, except for hearing aids. And as I understand it, talking to engineers and, and researchers in our company, there was a number of reasons for this. There was, well, maybe the, the power, it took too much power to run Bluetooth in hearing aids. Or the antenna was too big to, to fit into you know, what people wanted for the size of hearing aids. So there was a few barriers in there, but in the same labs 
where we are testing Bluetooth in our audio earbuds, uh, we are also testing our hearing aids. And so people got to talking and saying, hey, can we do this better? Can we, can we bring Bluetooth into that? And lo and behold, in 2010, we did. And that really set off kind of a whole new revolution in connectivity and hearing aids. For the first time, you were able to stream wirelessly from your hearing aids into various devices, into connectivity. And so, and then for GN, it said, okay, connectivity, that's accessibility, and this is important. This is important for the people who are using our hearing aids. That led to, and this is before I, again, before I was in the hearing aid industry, but certainly heard about it. That led to probably the watershed, I guess, of connectivity and hearing aids in 2014 with the made for iPhone. I mean, that, when Apple flexes and when Apple said, you know, does something, you, it gets publicity. And even not being part of this industry, I was reading about made for iPhone connectivity with hearing aids, right? And now, and in fact, not only was that garnering headlines, it was bringing more people into wearing a hearing aid. So, We've, we've heard about stigma, we've heard about all these things with hearing aids. I don't necessarily believe in all of those things, but it did bring people into trying hearing aids for the first time and said, this is pretty cool. I can use hearing aids just like my, my earbuds. And I can talk to people on my phone, I can listen, I can stream music and audio. So a real watershed mark, a real revolution in hearing aids, right? Followed by Asha into the Android phones as well too. So now we have you know, in essence, connectivity becoming a really important part of the hearing aid experience. But, along with that, it also led to a very complex kind of environment. So, this is a little bit of a, kind of a, a little bit of an eye chart, as they say sometimes. But, what happens, you know, you look at, going back even to the 30s with Telecoil and the FM, there's been a number of different systems out there to, for hearing aids to connect with wirelessly. Um, with the launch of I, with the uh, made for iPhone and Asha, it's great, but it also had hearing aid manufacturers using their own proprietary protocols with Bluetooth designed to, to match up with their hearing aids. And as Chuck mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the hearing aid industry realized this can't go on. That, that there needed to be one sort of a standard. And why? Because in a room like this, like Chuck said, depending on the hearing aid you had, depending on the phone you had, you could be listening to the same audio and getting very different experiences. And that wasn't, that wasn't good enough. That's not the consistency that we would want in those types of experiences. Why is that important, particularly for hearing aid users and for hearing care professionals? Because we have found, our research shows, that we know that connectivity is important. In fact, behind hearing speech and noise and overall sound quality, connectivity is the third most desired uh, attribute feature within hearing aids for people that are purchasing hearing aids today. Uh, connectivity is accessibility. Connectivity gives you freedom to listen to all sorts of things, right? And so it being very, very important, you know, for to have connectivity. Now, unfortunately, with this myriad of different types of protocols and standards and some of the inconsistencies and frustration, who here has had some frustration having uh, their hearing aids connect with their phones or anything? Anyone? Yeah, okay. So with that, you know, there's like, so it's not only frustrating for you, it's also frustrating for your hearing care professionals. And so in essence, people were either not using it or sometimes not even recommending it, saying it's just easier not to deal with it. And that's not good because connectivity is a very powerful tool. So, all that to say, in the fall of last year, we introduced um, Resound Nexia. And as, as uh, our latest hearing aid, and as Chuck said, this stemmed from, uh, well, I just back up and say, this particular hearing aid is, works with any of the existing, you know, systems that are out there from, from Telecoil uh, to, to, any, to Asha and everything, but most importantly with this new system that was developed with Bluetooth Low Energy Audio and AuraCast, it is the first hearing aid that has that capability. Bell tone hearing aids also have that. Jobber hearing aids also have that capability. Cochlear implants have that capability now as well. 
And as I understand it, um, Oticon hearing aids have some Bluetooth low energy audio, and uh, Signia has Bluetooth low energy audio as well, not necessarily um, AuraCast yet. But this was super important for GNA as a, commit, as a leader in connectivity, and I'm a big believer in connectivity back in 2010. We wanted to be first. We wanted to make sure that as this became the standard, and it is the standard, we wanted to make sure we had hearing aids for our, for our patients, for our clients, for our people to use. And so that's why we launched that in 2000, or the fall of last year with Nexia. Uh, along with that as well, too, there's a TV streaming plus. When we talk about transmitters, we heard, heard those folks talking about the transmitters. We actually have a little transmitter that you can put in your TV and use Bluetooth low energy audio and AuraCast. I want to take a moment and talk about Bluetooth low energy audio as well, because I don't want to understate that, if you don't understand the difference between that and the Bluetooth Classic. A lot of great advantages for, for hearing aid users. Number one, uh, uses less power. Two, less latency. And I'll explain a little bit about that in a second. And, um, uh, excuse me, less latency, and then it also has uh, great sound quality. So, sounds better, faster, you know, you're not going to get delay, and uses less, less, hear less power on your hearing aids. Pretty good deal from that. Bluetooth low energy audio also allows you to connect to multiple devices at the same time. Also a pretty cool thing. And, most importantly, as we're all here today talking about, enables AuraCast. So, it was a really important step, again, from a GN perspective, to make sure that we were, again, the first putting this type of technology into our hearing aids, advancing that next, taking that next leap with connectivity. And that is really, you know, where we are today with AuraCast. And so, when we think about, well, we, you've seen the use cases, you've heard people talk about it. Um, I won't go into all of that, but what I will say is, I don't know if you've listened to Andy Bellavia. He's, uh, he does a podcast called This Week in Hearing, and he brings up a, a really good analogy, and I'm going I'm to steal it with pride, um, and talk about how why AuraCast is going to be so much different. We've talked about the confusion or, or the inconsistency in the protocols that we've had previously and why this is going to be so different, and why adoption is going to be, once we hit that critical tipping point, point it's going to be so quick and so fast and we're going to see it happen. Um, he talks about accessibility and he uses a, an analogy of for ramps with uh, those with mobility challenges. And he says, you know, it took a long time and regulation and legislation and convincing of, of of different you know, government agencies and things to, to have ramps installed in buildings and on our sidewalks. And that was done for a specific segment of the population. Well, what we learned over time was that a lot of us can benefit from those things, whether it be people with strollers or you know, rolling up um, packages into buildings. Ramps became something that we could all benefit. Oracast is the flip of that, right? There's a reason why when Yes, the hearing aid manufacturers went to Bluetooth SIG and said we need to do better. But it quickly became evident that this kind of technology, AuraCast technology, could benefit everybody. Um, and so because of that, we're going to see, you know, from an accessibility standpoint, you don't have to convince, you know, that this is just for the hearing loss community. This truly is for everybody. And so it's going to accelerate that kind of adoption. We talked about Google. That Google's not going to put that on their maps if this is something that's not going to be happening, happening and happening quickly, right? So we talk about the future, but the future really is now when it comes to forecast. And clearly, and again, it was really pretty cool to see all the logos that you're going to get or what's happening now. We're really proud to be the first company to really embrace this top technology, make it available for everybody to use. And... Um, it's, it's like I said, the future is now, and I hope, uh, well, that's really all I have to say about the, the future is now with OraCast, and we're going to see that kind of adoption, you know, happening all over. Chuck, I'll turn it yeah. back to you. Yep. Get away from the speaker. Yep. 
So thank you, Rich. So we're going to close this out uh, here a bit, but as I mentioned before, you know, I put a bunch of logos up there to show the companies that are actually supporting uh, AuraCast and LE Audio and are, are introducing either the capabilities or enabling the capabilities in. And the, the forecasts are significant in terms of what's possible here within the next four to five years. It is going to take product cycles. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you know, I'm going to snap my fingers and then suddenly every single device is going to have it. You know, we are in a technology transition, and during a technology transition, you do have cycles that you have to go through in order to get the capabilities available to everyone and a critical mass of those capabilities. But we do see that product cycle being within a four to five year type time frame where you're seeing more and more devices, a couple of cycles, where you're going to end up with, by 2028, 3 billion Bluetooth-enabled devices with these capabilities shipping every single year. You're going to see 90% of all of the smartphones out there supporting these capabilities in it within the next, you know, next four to five years. And you're going to see more and more locations available with these capabilities as, as Amtronic and Listen ramp up and their, their distri distribution ramps up and as their, their installers ramp up. The, 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 the possibilities that are here for the future and, and for right now of these capabilities is is exciting to me in terms of where we're going and I think people ultimately recognize that and see the possibilities of not just supporting people with hearing loss but supporting audio access everywhere for everyone and that the beneficiaries of that will ultimately be the people with hearing loss. Now I'm going to close it out before we go into Q&A to just to say that you know we are as an organization uh, working towards how do we help you or how can we help you or how can you help us uh, and the public spaces with the, with the advocacy for these capabilities. Uh, we are building out an advocacy program, but the, ide the, the identity of that, that advocacy program is to integrate with the current programs that are available in the market today, or available from organizations such as, AL, uh, uh, such as the um, HLAA. So we want to promote accessibility for public spaces. We want to coordinate with this organization to help continue to deliver greater accessibility uh, to individuals. We want to help work within that, uh, that advocacy around broadening that message that this is a message about accessibility to technology and capabilities that will benefit everyone. It's not a single technology thing. I'm not going to try to come in here and convince you that your advocacy needs to shift from Loop to Oracast. That's not the way that we would approach this. This is about approaching it in terms of advocacy for people with hearing loss, regardless of where you are on that journey for hearing loss. And so we want to work with you and, and work with this organization to help you develop and deliver the overall messages that increase accessibility across the, the platforms, across technologies for all users in the future. So this is something we are working on and we're working too closely with the organization and, and uh, Anne and Sherry and others that have been working on the uh, on the, the um, uh, accessibility programs, or sorry, on the advocacy programs. So, if you want to try this out, uh, again, as I mentioned before, we have three conference rooms that are enabled with an Ori uh, uh, Oracast based system. This one, Cave Three, Cave One, and the Akamel uh, uh, conference rooms if you want to check out equipment and then use it for a future uh, workshop today and tomorrow. I, I encourage you to do so. Um, we're in the exhibition area and you can, check out the, you can check out the information there or check out the devices there. So leaving at that, I just want to open it up for Q&A, uh, give people an opportunity to ask questions. We've got a microphone. I think it's loud enough. We might need to turn it up. Um, I need a runner. Can, would anybody like to volunteer? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you for offering this session, and I'm really excited that a hearing technology um, company is jumping on this bandwagon um, even before or with some of the other, um, sorry, you might not be able to see caption, um, some other manufacturers like I was 
kind of surprised that Apple has not appeared on that list yet. Um, but I'm happy to see Samsung, even though I'm an Apple user now, but I might go back to Samsung. Um, anyway, two things. Please don't forget about us hard of hearing people when all these other non hard of pe hearing people jump on this bandwagon. So I can foresee the younger generation and the Apple AirPod users and everybody else in the world is going to be hitting up all the manufacturers to create products for them. So please don't forget about the hard of hearing people when that happens. And then my specific question is, um, when that Samsung phone is out, maybe it's not yet, or is it the 23, 24? Yeah, they all are out. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't have that yet, but if I get that next, um, I have, uh, I believe you said it has a receiver, right? It is a, it's a transmitter and it's an assistant, the phone itself. Then they have, they have their earbuds, which are the, which are the receiver, but it also works with my GN, GN hearing aids or Sennheiser uh, earbuds. It works with all of the Orcast enabled uh, um, devices. Darn. Okay. Because I have Cochlear Americas and 7, which is not yet enabled, so I don't have an N8, so I would not be able to use that, right? That, that's that's Cochlear's challenge. Yes, that's a Cochlear decision, uh, but they've announced the, the N8 uh, as being capable and they're working on the software to enable that. Right, right. Okay, thank you very much. To your left. Okay, uh, my name is John Hoover, and uh, how much on that transmitter uh, on that loop system, uh, how much does it cost? I know uh, installing the loops is very expensive, up to $25,000. So what is the general cost for this system? Sure, so um, when you're looking at the cost of, a, of an ORI system, um, the transmitter is comparable to the price of a, a loop amplifier for a, a large room. So you're still looking um, between um, $1,500, $3,000 for a transmitter, um, but the labor cost is drastically lower. Um, and so the installation process can then be undertaken much quicker. So if we look at a room like this, the guys laying the loop on the floor spent um, several hours installing this system on the floor. It was half a day, I think, per room, pretty much, to install the system. You've also got a copper cost going into the floor. Um, and so when you're looking at an ORI system, you've got to pull um, an Ethernet cable to put on the network that also provides power and you need to provide an audio input. So it's much quicker and simpler for the, uh, the infrastructure to go in around it. And that's really where it becomes a more affordable solution to be deployed on scale. Okay, great. I have a second question. Um, I did not see Starkey on the list. Are you guys collaborating with Starkey? So Starkey is, is one of the many uh, hearing aid companies that has been working on this specification. Uh, but I do not believe they have made their specific announcements around model numbers specifically for their hearing aids and what their what their process will be. I gave a I gave a microphone up here. You can God, there's um, someone waving way back there. Will this also be able to coordinate with car streaming systems and radio? For instance, I have a serious system in my car. Is that something that will work with it or? Is that just a completely different? It, it won't be able to work with a mobile system like that. So, so that's a great. It's a great question. Uh, you know, a, a an automobile. So we are working with the automotive industry. The automotive industry is looking at how they can use the broadcast capabilities for the benefit of people in the car, whether or not it's for streaming audio or it's for streaming in car alerts is is what they are kind of looking at but they're looking at various models for how broadcast could actually be utilized inside the inside the car but it can be used for that type of thing it's just a matter of what what applications do they think are best for the user inside the car and how we broadcast best uh, best benefit them yeah, that, that was really what i was wondering about because every so often my radio will be interrupted by an announcement that there is a car broke down ahead or some other traffic congestion ahead or something. 
I wondered if oral cast would be part of that. Yeah, it's, it, it's hard to know that specific application, but the automotive industry is looking at how to best utilize broadcast to benefit the users in the car. Uh, yeah, sure. you mentioned uh, type of a receiving device from using Oracast. So it, that's just another receiver. It's just a, it's a matter of how does that audio get transmitted into the uh, uh, to the user for uh, for sound. So same thing with cochlear. You can use bone conduction. You can use anything oh, effectively. Oh, Pardon? Oticon. What? Sorry. What's it's the question? Not, it's not cochlear. It's Oticon. Yeah. So I'm just saying that that it, it's it any receiver. Any receiver can utilize Oracast, uh, and however it is then, however the audio is then delivered to the user. I'm just giving you an example of that. Like, Oticon has actually already announced, I can't remember the net models, but they've already announced their support for, uh, that they will have support for uh, Oracast in their devices, uh, but they're enabling it, I mean, capable of it, but not, they have not yet enabled. Yeah, so a uh, quick question. You mentioned the scenario before of the airport, right? Yeah. So I travel a lot. I think that would be very useful. However, I see a problem, and I just want to make sure like how this works. So if I'm in the airport, ideally I'm watching a TV, right? But I also want to be like linked in to the gate announcements. And if the gate announcement came, it would be prioritized over the TV screen. Is that possible with, uh, with this technology? The, the capability exists within the specification to prioritize, to, to, to manage that. It's on the receiver end to manage the, to manage the understanding of what, and, and or the assistant, to understand what your priorities are and what, uh, what you want to listen to at any point in time. But you can mix, yes. Yeah. 